the village I lived in had only about 40 to 50 people at most. Everyone knew everyone. All 12 of us kids knew each other and played with each other. Naturally, some of us grouped together and explored the surrounding area since there wasn't much in the way of entertainment back then. This was mid to late 90s in rural Ohio. The village was old. The furthest back I could find about the village documentation-wise was that it was established in the late 1790s as a small trading hub for the local area. Ohio didn't become a state until 1803. My village had a single church in the center of it, an old schoolhouse converted into an actual house just next to it and pasture behind it with thick woods surrounding three of the four sides of the small town. My dad grew up around the area, so he was full of legends and stories about the place. One of those stories was about a small fort that was originally French, turned British, and finally colonial American in the area. Nobody really knew where exactly it was located, but there was a few mentions of a small fort in the area from the research I had done. One of the stories about the fort was that it was a primary trade route for the local native tribes and the influx of settlers that were arriving in the area. Naturally, conflicts arose as more and more people settled in the surrounding areas and eventually, all-out conflict ensued between the settlers and the native tribes. The fort was said to be destroyed by fire. People on both sides slaughtered each other and eventually, the natives were driven from the area with the help of a local militia. My dad always told me the land wasn't good, tainted in ways with bad energy. I guess when entire families are slaughtered and people being driven from their homeland, it can cause some long-term ill effects. When all of us kids were playing, we were always told two things. One, if the woods get quiet, you get quiet and leave immediately. Two, if your name is being called out and you're way out in the woods, do not respond. Go home immediately and never look back. Pretend you never heard it to begin with. Everyone in the village knew how quirky the area was. Most days were the usual bland days, while some days it was like a fairy tale. Periodically, other days it could be a nightmare. Now, the people of the woods were probably the most common entity everyone in the village knew of and were generally treated with respect and a wide berth. Some of the other things were generally best left well alone entirely. So now to my experience. In the late 90s, I was around 10 years old when I was overcome with an insatiable desire to go camping it was mid-August, so hot and muggy during the day, but rather mild and cool at night. I gathered two of my friends and told them about it, and they both liked the idea. Now, generally, nobody really camped in our woods. My parents, along with many others, really didn't like the idea of a group of 10 and 11-year-olds going camping alone. My dad said we could, as long as he came with us just to ensure we were safe. I reluctantly agreed. Prior to that night, I went out to scout out a good area to make camp at, and I knew of a fairly decent place that was close to the creek, relatively flat, and not too difficult to get to. I wanted to scout the area just to ensure it was cleared of debris and ready for tents. By this time, I was well acquainted with the people of the woods, and I made my offering before entering the woods. I didn't see them while on my journey or anything, so I felt pretty good about that. Once I arrived at the location, I began moving things around, clearing out the sticks, large stones, and making a fire pit, even going as far as stocking it with wood and throwing some larger sticks nearby for fuel later. I was so enthralled in what I was doing and so focused on getting the area cleared that by the time I was satisfied with what I had done, I had just noticed just how quiet everything around me became. When I say quiet, I mean dead silent. No birds, 
bugs. Not even the wind made a noise against the leaf litter. I immediately shut down everything I was doing. I stood there, looking around, slowing my breathing, and just trying to listen for the faintest sound I could. I don't know how long I was stood there motionless, a few minutes maybe, and then, in the far distance, I could hear a crow call, and almost immediately, I began hearing the chirping of robins, and even a faint whistling from the wind in the trees. The hair on my arms and neck were on end, and I figured, well maybe it was just me making a ruckus, that everything nearby quieted down because of that. Content with that logical reasoning, I began making my way back home to pack up for the night. Around 6pm that night, two of my friends made their way over with backpacks, tents, and both me and my dad were finishing up dinner. All four of us made ready, with everything we needed to begin trekking out to the site I prepared. Nothing all that noteworthy happened going to the site, even after setting up our tents, lighting the fire, making s'mores. It was shaping up to be a pretty fun night and rather enjoyable. Once we started to get ready to crawl into our tents for the night, around 10 or 11 pm, the wind started to pick up and my dad said we might be in for some rain, but he didn't seem to have a look of contentment on his face when he said that my dad loved rain. It was like he felt something was off, and it wasn't long that all of us started to feel that way. We all ended up crawling into our tents anyway. Since it was night, and possible rain incoming, trekking back home would have sucked. We should have walked back. We situated our tents in a half circle around the fire pit, which all were facing the creek, and the back of the tents facing the wood line. My dad was to the left of mine, in his military surplus tent. Me and my cheapo Walmart single person tent, just barely large enough for me, and my two friends to my right, in their own tents. The wind howled for some time, half an hour to an hour before it calmed down. Then it got quiet. No crickets, no wind, no wildlife. The creek itself, which usually bubbles happily along, sounded muted. All we had was the faint glow of embers from the fire pit in front of our tents, casting a warm glow. I could hear my heart throb in my ears, and I knew my dad and two friends were just as anxious as I was, as I could hear them shift uncomfortably. I heard one of my friend's tent zipper, and naturally, I undid mine too to see what was going on. As soon as I popped my head out to look, I saw my dad come out of his tent with the machete he had, and he faced the wood line. My friend had his head poking out too, and asked if I heard that noise. I didn't hear anything, my heart was pounding so hard, it was hard hearing him even whisper. We both partially got out of our tents to see what my dad was looking at, but all we could see was inky darkness. And then, I heard it. A distant faint. Hello? It was coming from some ways away in the darkness of the woods. I could see my dad shift uncomfortably on his feet, white knuckling his machete, looking into the wood line. Then again, the voice called out again. Hello? It didn't seem right, off-putting. Almost as if whoever was speaking was trying to speak in a very feminine voice. Faint and fragile. My dad motioned to me to grab some of the extra wood next to his tent and throw it on the fire, which I reluctantly did. Leaving the perceived safety of my tent didn't sit well with me. As the fire began to slowly grow in brightness, my dad stepped backwards near the fire and stood there facing the wood line. By this time, my other friend popped his head out of his tent too, and all three of us, including my dad, were watching the wood line, unsure what to expect. Nothing came out, and we didn't hear the voice again. An hour passed, and by this time, 
my dad was sitting on a large stone next to his tent, one leg crossed and a machete in his right hand, watching silently. Only the sound of crackling fire echoing against the shale cliff face across the creek. Several hours passed and both of my friends went back into their tents. Only me and my dad was out, me tending the fire and my dad watching and waiting. I could hear rustling on our right, just beyond the light from the fire in the tree line. My friend closest to it popped his head out, looked at me and asked, what? As if he was wanting me to repeat what I said. I didn't say a word, hadn't said a word since I came out of my tent the first time. I put my finger up to my lips and motioned to be quiet. By the time I did, my dad was standing next to me and told us both to shush, and immediately we heard someone say, Come here, in the same off-putting feminine voice as earlier. All three of us just stood there, peering into the direction the voice came from, and shortly after, we heard what sounded like something moving back deeper into the woods. It didn't sound heavy, it sounded like someone lightly trotting back into the woods. That was the last time we heard it. Shortly after, I'm assuming early morning, just before daybreak, the wood life returned. Crickets, the distant chirp of birds, and the whisper of the wind through the leaves. Once daybreak came, we all broke down our tents, packed up, and began hiking back home. We were paranoid the entire way back, stopping, listening, looking. We didn't see or hear anything or anyone. Nobody said a word on the way back. Once we made it to my backyard, my dad broke the silence and told us that what we experienced never happened and it would do us good not to say a word to anyone about it. He had fear written all over his face as if not even he had experienced something like that. To this day, I don't know what it was or who it was. I did end up asking my aunt next door later in life if she experienced something similar since she grew up in the area too, but even she was tight-lipped about it, saying we shouldn't have gone camping out there and my dad was a fool for letting us go. I have since left my village and moved out of state, and I've run into similar stories down here in the southeast with the same reluctance to explain what it was or could be. So if anyone could enlighten me, I'm all ears. I was recently discussing ghosts and sharing ghost stories with my best friend and remembered this strange experience I had during outdoor education camp in sixth grade. I realized I hadn't thought about it for many years and decided to tell it here because to this day I have no idea what I actually saw and it still gives me the creeps. My best friend had also been there at the time but I had been too afraid to tell her about what I saw, in case I was just crazy. We're now both in our early thirties. It was 2001, and the whole sixth grade class, about 60 kids, at my school, had a week-long camping field trip in some redwoods a couple of hours from our school. It was supposed to be a celebration for finishing elementary school, basically, it was a week of swimming, hiking, crafts, and adventure. It was great fun. On one of the last nights we were there, the camp aides took us on a night hike into the forest. There was about five to ten camp counselors or teachers with flashlights, and the students got little glow sticks to hold. We first gathered in a larger soccer field to get directions and organize our group. It was very dark and we could see all the stars in the sky. We were surrounded by thick, dark forest. As I marveled at the nature around me, I saw something white flitting about in my peripheral vision. 
I turned to see a strange rapidly shifting white entity. It seemed like it was glitching, the way it was sort of blinking in and out of existence. It was almost pitch black outside, yet the figure seemed to be internally lit with sparks of energy. Thinking it was my eyes adjusting to the dark, seeing floaters or ocular debris, I rubbed my eyes and blinked. I looked straight at it, expecting it to disappear, but it didn't. It actually seemed to become aware of me looking at it, as it moved back into the trees a little further when I continued to watch it move about. When I looked away, I could still see it in the corner of my eye start to come closer. It emerged from the perimeter of the forest. At first, it looked like a humanoid diaphanous figure, then it morphed into a wolf-like figure, running on all fours, quickly. There was a good distance between me and this spirit, but I still was scared and felt sick to my stomach. I thought I was going crazy or something was wrong with my eyes. At the time, I didn't believe in ghosts and had only a couple of spooky encounters, like cabinets slamming shut randomly. Up until then, I always felt that there was a logical explanation for everything. Anyway, we finally began our hike. My best friend was right next to me, but I told her nothing of this creepy ass shifting transparent creature thing in the forest. The thought of her not being able to see it, or thinking I was crazy, was too much of a risk. To my relief, we turned away from the side of the forest where this thing was, and start to enter the forest at the opposite side. The trail was very steep. We hiked in a long line, with campades at the front, middle, and back of our group. I was somewhere in the middle. After 15 minutes or so of hiking, I remember feeling a prickling sensation down my spine, and my stomach churned. I glance behind me, and that's when I see the forest thing at the very back of the line, following us, or me. Although there were still lots of kids in line, separating me and the ghost, it was so much closer than before when I had seen it in the woods by the field. It now had a distinctly humanoid form, although its edges seemed blurry and in still constant flux. It had no face, and if I stared at it directly, it would fade somewhat, but not disappear. Unlike before, when looking at it peripherally, it became much more solid in form. I was scared witless, but said nothing to anyone. I decided my eyes were still tricking me. Once we got to the top of our destination, it was time to turn around. I saw the figure still hanging around the end of the line. The front of the line doubled back, and to my horror, I realized I would be forced to pass by this figure. As soon as I got within 15 to 20 feet of the figure, it dissipated like steam or smoke right in front of me. I never saw it again. I didn't sleep that night in the open air cabin and was very relieved when we were going home the next day. So about three years ago, I went camping with my girlfriend, now ex, as she had expressed interest but had never been. The spot we went to is in the Huron National Forest and is my go-to trail or camp spot as it's hidden deep in the forest and the access to the trail is close and easy for ATVs, etc. My family has been going to this spot for about six years and my friends that introduced me about 10 or so years. We went for a weekend trip and I'm glad we didn't go any longer. When we got there, Everything was going well, except we did notice a group of people that were hanging out next to our campsite, but they were just stargazing and ended up leaving. Then, around midnight, is when the weird stuff started to happen. At first, it sounded like someone was laughing at us, 
but the laugh never ended and got very high pitched and sounded as if it kept going. After a while, we both got kind of scared and went into the tent to try and sleep. And then, that's when the laugh noise moved up higher and then started to circle the campsite. After a while of that happening, it just suddenly stopped and then started again around 3 a.m. When it started again, the fire was going out, so I went to stoke the fire with my shotgun in hand and turned on my flashlight to see if maybe I could see any coyotes or something around the campsite, but I didn't see anything or hear any movements below. This went on until 6 a.m., and then stopped, and that was finally when we were able to get some rest. After we woke up, we checked around the campsite and didn't see anything out of the ordinary, so we packed up. Once we were packed and good to go, I start my vehicle, and it's completely dead. That really freaked me out, as I'm always paranoid about leaving things plugged in that kill the battery and made sure everything was closed properly and unplugged, yet somehow the battery still died. I was able to get a jump from AAA. That phone call was hard to explain, and the lady who took the call didn't believe me, but at the end we both laughed. After that happened, I told my friend who had shown me the campsite, and also has a cabin in the same forest, roughly 25 miles from the campsite, about what happened, and he got freaked out. He told me about two incidents which he has had, one at the campsite and one at his cabin. At the campsite, he stated that one night, after we had all returned from trail riding and went to bed, he stayed up to hang out by the fire and have a few drinks. While he was hanging out, He was just looking off into the distance and saw a pair of eyes up in the trees looking directly at him. He described them as bioluminescent eyes and he flashed his high power flashlight at them but there was nothing there and as soon as the flashlight turned off they were there looking right back at him. So he packed up and went right to bed. He didn't tell us because he didn't want to scare us At the cabin, he was hanging out with his brother and they were both just chilling by the fire outside when they both saw a pair of eyes looking at them from a trail that leads into the woods. They stated that at the height the eyes were looking at them, whatever it was had to be seven feet plus tall. They started shooting at it with their rifles, uh, two 30-30s, and the eyes disappeared but once they were done, they reappeared and were closer. At that point, they both freaked out and got back in the cabin and they did not leave until daylight. We have no idea what this could have been, but all felt very scared when these events were happening. After we all talked about it, one of the brothers thinks it was a Wendigo. I don't really know what it could be, but I haven't felt that scared since. This happened in August of 2018. My fiance and I were on the second night of our two night camping trip at a popular campground about a half hour from where we live. For reference, my fiance is black and we live in a predominantly white, conservative, and racist area. This is important later. Our first night, we kept hearing noises in the woods around us. The campsite right beside ours to the right was occupied, but the one to the left was not. The campsites are about 150 yards apart, and we had camped here in the exact same plot a year before. Needless to say, we were familiar with the area and the various kinds of animals that lived in the woods. The first night, we heard shuffling around our tent. It was obviously something large moving around. We brushed it off and assumed it was just a deer. 
Now, back to the main event. On August 11th, we spent the day at the battlefields, a town over, with my family. They had all been invited to join us for the day by my fiancé as a surprise for me, while he proposed to me. We stayed with my family into the evening, about 6pm, before heading back to our campsite. When we got back, things were really odd. Someone had obviously been in our tent. Our blankets were thrown around, clothes were on the floor, and my backpack was rearranged and I was missing underwear. But hey, we were stupid 19 year olds and decided that since whoever had busted in had left and hadn't taken anything important, it was fine and they wouldn't come back. So we set up a campfire and sat out until it was dark, roasting hot dogs and s'mores, smoking cigarettes and celebrating our engagement. Around 9.30 p.m., we put out our fire and decided to go into our tent for the night to celebrate a little more. Nothing too loud or obnoxious. Immediately after we finished, we started to hear the noises outside our tent again, but this time we focused in. We heard clear footsteps and at one point, a man whispering. We looked at each other and our eyes got wide. Someone was definitely walking around outside our tent. We were still completely silent, just listening to the footsteps, and we heard whispering again. Crap, make that two men walking around our tent. As if we had the ability to read minds, my fiancé said, I have to go to the bathroom, and I agreed. The bathroom was up a hill from our site, most people who were in the lower sites, like ours, drove their cars up to the bathroom. Now, here's the part I still get chills thinking about. We got up, and we were getting dressed. My fiancé had just turned on the light in our tent and put his binder on, when a man spoke directly to us from outside the tent. What are you doing? I can't even describe how malicious and menacing this voice sounded. It was clearly directed at us, and he said it with a snicker. He was watching us through the walls of the tent. Again, for this part, we were stupid 19-year-olds, so we decided to just run for it to the car. My fiancé grabbed his pocket knife and his keys and stepped out of the tent. He pulled me with him, and we ran like hell to the car. I heard the footsteps running behind us, and then turning, and then running up to another campsite. At the bathroom, we talked over our options. We talked about sleeping in the car, or driving into town. Then we had another idea. We drove back down to our campsite, and began packing everything into our car. At this point, it was around midnight. We moved faster than I think either of us thought possible wrapped up the tent with our belongings still in it, and grabbed our folding chairs. We were all packed in five minutes and hopped into the car to leave. I jumped out at the end of the drive and grabbed our nameplate, which had my full name on it, off of the post. As we pulled out of the campsite, we saw our assailants for the first time. Stalking through the woods onto our campsite were two tall white men, I realized that these were the same men who had been driving past our campsite the whole time we were there, just glaring at us and muttering to each other. One was wearing camo hunting gear, and the other was wearing a confederate flag tank top. Both were carrying large hunting knives, unsheathed and at the ready. They turned when they saw our car driving away, and one started to make chase until the other stopped him. I made eye contact with the man in camo, and he smiled the most terrifyingly evil smile at me, and shook his head slowly. We drove the long way home, taking all the weirdest, hardest to follow roads, and called my dad so he would know we were coming. When we got home, we told my dad everything, and he shrugged it off as us being paranoid, so I never told anyone else 
until now. I'm convinced to this day that this was going to be a racially motivated attack. The campground was not heavily populated and my fiance was the only non-white person at any of the campsites. It was no accident that the two men who had been shadowing us since our arrival and wore Confederate flags and had one on their truck decided to target the interracial couple. I still get cold chills when I think about how close we were to being killed or seriously hurt that night and just how lucky we were that our reckless plan to just make a run for it worked. So to those men who stalked our campsite with the hunting knives, let's not meet. Here's a fun little story that seems to be never ending in my life. I'll preface this with I used to go to summer camp for seven years, up to three weeks throughout each summer there. I adore this place, and it's truly the reason I'm the person I am today. Of course, we had our ghost stories that we told, most of them fake, but there is one real one, and man, I'm getting chills just writing it. There was a girl who died at the camp back in the 70s, let me say it again, she really did die there. I saw the records as a last night gift. She died of a heart issue during a soccer game. She just dropped on the field during the game and was then brought through the camp to the main lodge and was officially pronounced dead there. She had been complaining of headaches all week and then she suddenly collapsed and died in the basement of the main lodge. It's very tragic but she always wore a yellow raincoat everywhere. That was her thing, and many of the staff have claimed to see her on the steps of her old cabin crying at night. I forgot about the story and told it simply as a campfire ghost story, in much better detail than this, I assure you. Anyways, years go by and I head off to college. I made friends with some people who were highly in tune with the paranormal world, I go to college in a completely different state, seven hours away, but my one friend was able to distinctly describe to me how this little girl looks out of the blue and how the camp looked overall. I had never told her this story prior to her description. My friend told me this girl had attached herself to me. My assumption is that I keep her memory alive and I know her name though I will never speak it. It's been over a year since that night, and ever since, I can see her sometimes at night. She'll either be standing in my bathroom, just observing, or standing somewhere, and I never get an overly negative feeling, but it's not positive either, and I've gotten used to it. I moved into a new house this year, and I hadn't even seen her in quite a while, but... The other night, I woke up at 3.37 a.m. I looked over to a chair in my room and I saw her sitting on the floor crying. I just looked, felt the sadness, and went back to bed. I didn't want to give that attention and I've been thinking about this ever since. I've never been a non-believer, but I have to see it to believe it. Although I am open to the unexplainable and enjoy reading about it, I also love when something is debunked. I have always found the scariest things to be people. This experience might have something to do with the way I perceive things now. It happened in the late 90s, maybe early 2000s. I was probably between eight and 10 years old and in the Cub Scouts. Our troop would pretty much always go to the same campground. They had maybe 10 big cabins. Each cabin had a small kitchen, a dining area with four to six picnic tables, and a giant room with about a dozen bunk bed cots lined up along the two walls. There would be a burning stove in the center. In our troop, all of the boys' dads would go camping too. 
the dads would take the bottom bunk and the boys would be on the top. This particular time, we got a corner bunk closest to the front door. My best friend and his dad, a Vietnam vet and tough guy, were the next bunk over. A little about me. I was always a very shy and socially anxious person. I only ever spoke when spoken to by an adult, and only really talked much with my best friend. I was also kind of a sissy, and still am. These were just one-nighter camping trips, and after a normal day, it's now bedtime. It's cold out, so there is a fire in the stove casting a warm reddish glow around the big room. However, it's still dark inside. I can't remember if I couldn't fall asleep or if I woke up, but I was awake. The whole room was dimly lit up, and it was like shooting stars in a light show all above the room in the peaks above the bunks. It was like a massive party. I can't believe it, and look over at my friend to see if he's awake. He is sound asleep. I look back at the light show, and a dimly lit white light swoops down and comes towards me. As it gets closer, I see a dimly lit white girl's face, but with big black circles as eyes, about two or three inches. Her face is about a foot from mine, and we just stare at each other. It was kind of like the ghostly apparition that came out of the ark in Indiana Jones, but she didn't transform and was not menacing. I don't remember if she was floating or if I was looking down at her on the floor as she looked up at me. I don't do or say anything. I don't scream or try to wake anyone up. I'm not sure if I was frozen or didn't want to bother anyone. I was more curious, like, what is going on? This is weird. After staring at each other for maybe a minute or two, I start to freak out, wondering what I should do. I decide to just turn my back on the situation. I roll over, face the wall, and close my eyes. Eventually, I fell asleep. We all got up the next morning and left. I did not feel good, and I did not tell anyone about what happened. A couple of years later, on another camping trip, some of the kids were talking about ghosts, and I guess there was a rumor that one of those cabins was haunted. I think I know which one. I'm a 25-year-old female, and at the time, I was 16 or 17. My then-boyfriend and two of our other friends decided to go camping in a small patch of woods next to a neighborhood that was being developed. And this small patch of woods was roughly 900 feet across both ways. On the left side, if you were viewing it from the road, was the undeveloped neighborhood. No people living in the houses. They're mainly just wood and no windows or actual walls. And on the right side was a mile-long driveway that led up to a house a little over half a mile past the patch of woods. Pretty deserted. So we get our tent, fire pit, chairs, etc. set up, and we're relaxing as it starts to get dark. When we hear extremely loud screaming coming from a woman, maybe four to five hundred feet away. At first, there weren't any words we could make out, but then there was a help and a no, and then the loudest, most terrifying scream was cut off mid-scream. We can't see through these trees. They're thick. It's getting darker, so we get the hell out. Leave all our stuff behind. As we're walking back to the undeveloped neighborhood where we parked, keep in mind the screaming was coming from over that way of the woods, so we had to go near the long driveway to the road, around the tiny bit of woods into the underdeveloped neighborhood where we had parked, I am immediately on the phone with the police, who were trying to tell me it was, quote, just a cat in heat. From where we parked, we were facing the woods. A man comes out, 
dragging something in heavy sheets or cloth or something, spots us and starts coming towards our car. The police pulled in right then, the man ran, and as it turned out, he had killed a woman about 400 feet from where we were camping. Don't know if he was ever caught, but let's not meet, please. Back in 2011, I was within a circle of friends that made it a tradition to go camping at a certain spot every May long weekend. The spot we chose was in a beautiful area, right on the edge of a large lake, and was located on government land. The lake itself had a dam on it, so during May long, the water levels were always low, if not completely empty, making it possible to walk across it. People were allowed to camp there as long as they weren't causing trouble or making a mess, and it was generally a good time for everyone. The spots themselves were placed far enough apart that you had your own privacy, but not far enough that you couldn't meet other people. In this particular year, our spot was in the middle of a hill with one campsite below us and one above us. The first night of our trip happened without incident. During the second day, the people staying at the site below us had moved in. We didn't think much of it and continued drinking throughout the day and into the night. At about around midnight, the people at the campsite below us were really out of control. They were yelling and screaming and their music had gotten even louder. So our friend Ben went down to ask them to turn it down. He was promptly punched in the face and he came back to inform us that he was 90% sure they were on drugs. After that, the vibe wasn't as relaxed and we were all somewhat on edge. I was feeling really tired, so I just decided to go to bed. Some of my friends were still awake, including Ben and one couple, Lily and Derek, that were visiting another campsite we had made friends with that day. I could hear that the campsite below us were still blasting their music and partying pretty hard, but I just tried to ignore it and go to sleep. I don't know what time it was when I was jolted awake, parts of this are somewhat of a blur. All I know is that I sat straight up as soon as I heard the screaming and yelling coming from outside my tent. I quickly ran outside to find our campsite in chaos. One of my friends was clutching their chest. People were running around and screaming to call 911. I was quickly informed of what happened. Apparently, not long after I had gone to bed, the people camping at the site below us decided they weren't finished talking to Ben, and on their way up, they had encountered Lily and Derek walking back. Now, Derek and Ben are about the same height and have the same color hair, so they assumed that Derek was Ben and bottled both him and Lily over the head with a full glass bottle. I don't know if it was the same guys that showed up at our campsite, but I was told that everyone else was sitting around the fire when two or three huge guys appeared from the darkness and walked over to them. One had a paring knife and the other had a butcher's knife in their hands. Ben saw the knives and had gotten up to talk to them and had barely spoken a word while the guy with the paring knife stabbed him once in the chest. At the same time, some of the people of the campsite above had seen the guys coming and came down to help. One of the guys, Tim, was coming down the hill when the guy with the butcher's knife ran up to him and stabbed him in the stomach. From there, sheer panic ensued. People called 911, but the ambulance was over half an hour away. This is where I came out of the tent. Tim's wound was bleeding profusely, and he was losing blood way too quickly. His friends ended up putting him in the back of his car and speeding off to meet the ambulance halfway. Ben was also bleeding, but his wound wasn't as deep as Tim's, and we were able to keep him calm until an ambulance arrived. 
the people with the knives ran off into the darkness, back down to their campsite, and took off in their Land Rover. My boyfriend at the time and I had gotten into his car and drove to the entrance to try and flag down the policemen on their way to the scene. Once they arrived, we were informed to stay in the car, as they had released a canine search unit to hunt down the people who stabbed our friends. By the end of the night, they had arrested the men. They had tried to flee by driving their vehicle across the lake bed, where they got stuck in a muddy section of the lake. They were on a concoction of several drugs, as suspected. Luckily, both Tim and Ben survived, although Tim had lost a lot of blood and took a few weeks to recover from his wounds. Derek and Lily had huge goose eggs, and possibly one person had a concussion, but I can't recall. It was definitely the scariest thing I have ever experienced, and a few of us had to testify against them in court. My husband and I went camping for the first time ever in Arizona as part of our long trip out west. I had picked out this really cool place that was on a mountain overlooking a beautiful landscape. It's next to a cliff and in a really isolated location. I'm talking like 20 miles out on gravel roads in the middle of the national forest. So we get there and set up our tent and hike a little bit and take pics of the surrounding area. We see a few cars parked around two tents and decide to stop and talk to the other campers nearby because we had heard that there was going to be a bad storm that night. These were four guys who were from Arizona and they told us not to worry and that the storm didn't get that terrible around this area. That was all the persuading that we needed to stay. Later on, we're walking a bit further down the campsite we see a woman there with her dog and another older lady. We smile and wave and continue to hike down a bit further into the forest. Let me elaborate on that. Because of the storm, we are one among maybe a total of seven campers that decided to stay and withstand the night. We watch the sunset when we get back to our campsite, make sure our car was only a few yards away and go into our tent when it gets too dark to see. There are no stars tonight due to the storm clouds, and it hasn't begun to rain yet, so we decide to try and sleep right away, so that we could possibly sleep through the storm when it does hit. It is an insanely windy night, so it's hard to sleep, but eventually, we get a bit of shut-eye. I wake up at 10.30pm, to the sound of crazy thunder rolling through the mountains and rain hitting down on our tent. I'm a little freaked out because they get a lot of flash floods out here and I didn't want to fall off the side of the cliff, but I tell myself to try to sleep and eventually I doze off again. It's around 12 midnight and I'm awake again, this time because I'm hearing something heavy hitting the side of our tent like full on sounded like someone could have been punching our tent and sliding something down the side of it. I open my eyes and can't see anything, it's completely dark, no light whatsoever. The sound continues every couple of minutes and at this point I'm crapping bricks. Suddenly I hear footsteps right next to my side of the tent, they are slow but steady. I feel my entire body freeze up. I seriously start thinking about how this is it and I'm going to die. My heart is beating so fast that I'm certain whatever is out there can hear it. Then, whatever it is, lets out a deep sigh right on the opposite side of the tent. I'm thinking it's a bear and realizing that I might actually have to face this thing. So, in a desperate call for my husband's mind-reading powers, I squeeze his hand really hard, repetitively, and he wakes up. But instead of reading my mind, he blurts out, What's wrong? Why are you squeezing my hand? Right as he says this, the footsteps stop. I don't hear the footsteps again, 
so after a while, I break out of my frozen state and tell him what I heard. We decided it might have been an animal passing by, but whatever is hitting our tent continues every so often, and I'm starting to go a little insane from this night, wondering what's going on. We convince ourselves that it's just pine needles falling from the trees above us and try to sleep again. We just need to make it through one night, then we can laugh about all of this in the morning. A couple of minutes go by, and suddenly, the tent caves in on my husband's side, right on his head. He whispers that he feels something is pushing the tent down. I feel my heart instantly sink. I'm freaking out, thinking it's a bear that just sat on his head. But he decides to push back, and we hear the familiar noise of something sliding off our tent that we've been hearing for the past few hours. We then realize that it's been snowing outside and that the noise we heard hitting our tent was heavy ice falling from the trees. Our tent is covered in thick ice and my husband pushes the tent from inside until all the ice slides off. Still determined to make it through the night and a little relieved that it was just ice and not a bear, we try to sleep and make it to sunrise. We keep on the small light that my husband luckily brought with him, just to calm us down a little. Things are starting to seem normal again. We both close our eyes. It's 3am at this point, not even 30 minutes after we're settling down. My literal worst nightmare happens. Out of the pitch black night, I hear a woman screaming. We distinctly hear her say, what the f***? Oh my god, what the f***? Followed by some other non-tangible words that sound something like help. The way that she screams doesn't sound like anger. It sounds like pure terror and a sense of panic. My husband and I are both frozen, looking at each other. I quickly shut off our light and start panicking and asking what we should do because what the hell, how is this really happening right now? While we're trying to decide what to do for the next few minutes, we hear her again, but this time, she's screaming, no, 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 as we hear a car speed off into the night. I'm in tears at this point. We have no idea what's happening. It's dead silent now, save for the icy rain hitting our tent. It definitely sounded like she wasn't in the car, but more like she was desperately yelling after it or begging not to be hurt. And this, this was the breaking point. Because I could take the bad weather, I could take the possible bear outside my tent, I could even take the ice falling on our heads in one of the warmest states in America. But one thing I cannot and will not ever be able to handle is a screaming person in the middle of the pitch black woods at 3 a.m. We decide to get the hell out of there, and even contemplate leaving our tent and booking it to our car. But instead, we try to stay level-headed and grab our valuables and put them in the car first. We frantically gather our things and stay close as we shuffle to our car. I close the door and keep the lights off for a while, scared to attract any unwelcome visitors. And while my husband goes back to grab the tent, I start the car and call 911. I tell them what I'd heard and where we are, and they say they are sending someone to the campsite to make sure everything is okay. Only thing is, we are literally in the middle of nowhere, and it will definitely take them more than an hour to arrive. Not to mention, the storm left those gravel roads in some pretty terrible conditions. So my husband and I decide to start driving, and it's like 3.30 a.m. now. As we drive out of the campsite, my husband notices one last eerie detail that stuck with me. The four guys that we had talked to earlier had left. All three of their cars were gone, while their tents remained. Whatever scared them off, they surely left in a hurry. It was only after we started driving that the thought occurred to me Whatever was walking next to my tent 
may not have been an animal. It very well could have been someone lurking around the tent who decided to go after the girl we had seen previously on our hike. I'm not quite sure what went down on that lone mountain that night and I hope that everyone got out okay. So, whatever was at our campsite that night, terrorizing us all, let's not meet again. A buddy of mine and I try to camp twice a month. Now that I have a vehicle that can be trusted to get me to some of the more remote areas of our state, we planned a camping trip for a weekend in February 2022. We chose a fairly remote location that we had been to the previous weekend. That weekend, we were the only people we had seen within one mile of our camp spot. Friday night, we got there and set up. This story takes place Saturday night. It's 9pm, so the sun is long gone and the moon hasn't quite risen yet. It's pitch black out other than what our fire lights up. Suddenly, we hear a man screaming. We listen intently, silently sharing an anxious look. At first, we were hoping it was someone drunk and having a little too much fun, but it quickly became obvious this isn't fun party screaming. It isn't even like he's hurt. It sounds full of despair, anger, and anguish. I'm going to take a moment to remind you that this is 9pm, pitch black night, in the middle of nowhere woods, five miles from the nearest cell phone signal. We hadn't seen anyone in hours. The screaming continues for what felt like hours, but probably about five solid minutes. We had no idea what to make of it and start feeling extremely paranoid. We gather up anything remotely close to a weapon, and tried to come up with explanations of the screaming while keeping our eyes on the forest around us. After about 15 tense minutes of fear-induced paranoia, I nearly fell out of my seat as I watched a flashlight and lantern slowly enter our camp. I greeted the stranger with a basic, how's it going, before he was even lit up by the fire. He responded quickly and flatly, by asking if we could do him a favor. That depends on the favor, my buddy and I said in unison, obviously tense, holding our weapons close to us. The stranger proceeded to ask if he could hang out for a second by the fire. Given the two of us and one of him, plus our myriad of weapons gathered from around the camp to within our arm's reach, we decided to agree and let him hang out. After a short second of awkward silence, I ask him what the hell is going on. He proceeds to tell me and my buddy that he was camping down the trail with his buddy and that his buddy had snapped and tried to kill him. Wait, what? I said before the thought even finished processing in my head. Is that the screaming we heard earlier? The man slowly nods, staring blankly into the fire and began his story. He said, we were just hanging out, man. We came up earlier today and my buddy just freaked out. He started screaming and screaming and just wouldn't stop. Then he attacked me, he lunged at me and I told him to just back off and chill, you know? Well, he kept coming after me and it started getting pretty violent and I'm pretty sure he was going to kill me. So I grabbed my car keys, the lights and ran. I don't know what to do, man. He chased me when I ran, and I don't know what to do. We don't have any firearms or anything, but we do have a hatchet. My buddy and I look at each other for a second, completely astonished. Then, something horrible dawned on me. Wait, he chased you? Like, he's on his way here? Right now? The man just slowly nods in reply. And right on cue like some terrible horror movie come to life, we hear screaming from maybe 30 or 40 feet from our camp down the main trail. I just want your balance, Gary. I want your balance. Gary, where are you? Where? Gary. 
I'd never in my life heard a man scream like this. I'd never heard anything like it in my life. It was brutal, guttural screams that were shrill to the ears, yet deep in pitch. The sound of someone gone completely mad, and the way he said the stranger's name would switch erratically from long and sing-songy to short, guttural punches of sound. We killed our lights, became silent, and listened. By some miracle, the madman didn't notice our camp and continued walking down the trail, screaming the whole way. We ended up chatting with who we'll call Gary for hours, listening to the screaming getting further and further. We come to find out they had taken four and a half to five grams of magic mushrooms each and his buddy, who we'll call Ty, was a co-worker of his and was fine for three and a half hours, then suddenly snapped. It seemed as though Ty thought he could kill Gary and steal his good trip. We heard the screams get further and further over two hours. By this time, it's 11pm, the moon is starting to come out, and it's below 30 degrees Fahrenheit. Ty had no jacket or flashlight according to Gary. My buddy and I are way too drunk to drive out of camp to get cell service, as it was snowy and icy and required two to three miles of highway driving after getting off the trail, and Gary was still lightly feeling the effects of weed and mushrooms, so he couldn't drive either. We had to make the decision to let the guy wander, hope he sobered up and could find his way back. And he did, oh he did, right into our camp. We hear yelling after about an hour of no screams, maybe 30 to 50 feet from camp again. Hey, help, please help me, I'm lost. And we can tell the man's walking from the woods into our camp. We tell Gary to hide just in case and greet the man with me carrying my 12 gauge shotgun and my 40 caliber pistol holstered my buddy carrying his AK-47 style rifle and his two 9mm glocks holstered and with our flashlights on their brightest settings in his face. He was about 6'2 or 6'3 and approximately 300 pounds. We talked to him, decided he was calm enough to walk with and walked him back to his camp. He seemed really remorseful, said he blacked out and didn't remember anything and had a falling out with his buddy. We escorted him back to his camp down the trail, returned, and told Gary that Ty seemed cool and if anything else happened to scream and come running, we would come out and help him out. It ended up being a happy ending. We made friends with Gary and I got his phone number to make sure the next day he got back into town safely, back to his wife and kid, and we're actually planning a camping trip with him soon. But Ty who wandered screaming like a deranged maniac into the forest, potentially wielding a hatchet to murder your friend to steal his good trip, or whatever it is your psychosis-filled mind was thinking. For the love of God, let's not meet again. Update. I met with Gary for a beer today. It was a pretty emotional and exciting reunion, so I wasn't able to ask or get the answers to all the questions but here's what I gathered. Gary is doing great and has a new outlook on life after this experience. As for Ty, there was no lasting psychological effects that we're aware of. It obviously strained their relationship and I doubt they'd ever have true trust again, but they seem to be on talking terms at least. Years ago, my parents bought a piece of land in the southwestern Colorado prairie near the Huerferno River, deep in the middle of nowhere. I've lost count of all the camping trips we've had in my dad's expensive canvas tent, atop what we would later dub as Cyclone Hill, on account of the furious winds we've experienced camping on top of that hill. Some gusts powerful enough to rock our F-150 back and forth. Immediately upon exiting the car, you feel the land. Call them spirits or psychic remnants, 
or just the knowledge of so many eras past, leaving an indelible mark. The feeling of being watched is instant and lasting. Below Cyclone Hill is a spiraling labyrinth of arroyos dug out from flash floods over time. What's called is the deepest arroyos connect and lead a trail down south to where the road curves around the land and heads west if you know which arroyos to follow. Usually this road is washed out completely and instead of hard dirt road, there's about a foot or two of quick mud. As a kid growing into a teenager and then adult, I learned how to track animals that use the arroyo trails at night. Mostly these are just coyotes which yip and sing throughout the night. Eerie at first, but I've always found it kind of cute listening to them make their way throughout the arroyo labyrinth, yipping and howling and singing all the way. There are jackrabbits that are almost too fast to see, lizards that live in the woodpile, and about a billion different bugs. There are beautiful families of hawks living in select areas. For years, a great white owl lived in an old dried off shoot of the river near cliff walls that rise on either side of the Werferno the further east you walked, and occasionally you would hear this owl screech, and it was the most hauntingly beautiful thing you might ever hear. The only neighbors we have are tarantulas about the size of a frying pan that like to say hi to you in the morning by climbing up the walls of your tent. They're very friendly. So, now I've established this area to you, and hopefully demonstrated that I know this land like the back of my hand, let me explain, or try to explain, what happened to my dad and me, one random day camping on our land. We always wake early to watch the sunrise, which is always worth it. It was summer, and the temperature at midday climbed into the hundreds, so you relish the cool, sweet, dewy mornings. While drinking coffee, my dad off sitting at our table, lashed to the tent, so the wind didn't take it to Kansas. I walked around to the west side of our 12 by 12 canvas tent, to where we keep a sizable pile of wood for our camping stove. As I turn the corner to walk along and inspect our pile of wood, I noticed something odd, and when I looked down, I saw a footprint. The prairie dirt was displaced with a perfect shoe print. It was a simple shoe pattern and very oval, like bulky skate shoes, except with more rounded sole. The shoe itself was maybe a size 5, tiny, especially compared to my size 12 boot. I knelt down to look at it, and that's when I realized there were more both in front and behind me. Behind the tent, about 35 to 40 yards is the road you come in on that curves westward after sloping down about a mile south. The footprints came from that direction. At this point, in a sort of half crouch, completely forgetting the coffee in my hand, I followed the tracks all the way to the road. They were almost perfect indents every time, and what made me puzzled is how long the stride was. Imagine your normal step and how long of a stride that takes up. Now take into account height and possible leg length. Now this is possible I guess, but isn't it odd to imagine someone with very tiny feet goose stepping along the prairie, making strides you'd see someone make who was well over six feet? I certainly thought it was strange as I tried to match the stride and couldn't even though I'm over six feet. Plus, with this strange stride, I could roll out my mother and sister who A. weren't there and B. had short legs. Nobody else came here. There are no houses or people and our land is clearly marked and fenced about as well as you can fence that land. At the road, the track stopped I don't mean I lost them down the road, I mean they stopped. There was the road, then two perfect prints side by side, as if someone had set their shoes down. 
nothing before that. The idea that someone could drive up to our camp, get out, and walk past our tent is creepy, but I find it very hard to believe. If you've never been to a prairie, you might have gotten the idea from my mentioning of the wind and animals that nights out there are loud as they are in the mountains or foothill campgrounds with lots of bugs and animal noises. You would be wrong. Yes, you can hear the coyotes, but they aren't nearly loud enough to penetrate the quiet of night. It's so quiet that the slightest of sounds would wake up any moderate to heavy sleeper and both my dad and I are light sleepers. The tracks I found by the tent and woodpile literally passed my dad's head on the other side of the canvas tent. Whatever made them literally could have touched him they were so close. With the way they were walking too, I find it very hard to believe we wouldn't hear that, considering we've woken many times to critters coming to check out our tent. It is possible I misread the tracks, sure, but bear in mind I've been doing it my whole life and have tracked animals back to their dens before. It's much easier in the prairie compared to the mountains or grassland because the ground is dirt and displaced dirt looks different to non-displaced dirt. A shoe print is a shoe print and the distance between them was enough to make me believe this person was goose-stepping or just very tall with very long legs and very tiny feet. All that is just odd. So where do the tracks go? By now I've informed my dad and showed him everything I've found up until that point, including freaking him out some by pointing out how close the tracks were to him, separated by just a sheet of canvas. We geared up and followed the tracks out past the tent and down. The tracks descended the hill, never breaking the long stride which is not only hard as hell to do, but dangerous as the prairie dirt could easily slide on you and send you down the hill face first. I know this from experience. Once down the hill, the tracks descended into the arroyos and to our shock, perfectly followed the arroyo trail. We tracked these footprints with true trepidation growing more and more perplexed as the tracks crazily walked up and down the arroyo walls at such extreme angles and whatever made them had to be walking almost sideways at some points. When we reached the road and the washout, we found the tracks stopped once again just as they had appeared at the top of the slope. Only now we would be able to tell if a car passed through here and picked up Mr. or Mrs. Footprints, but there weren't any car tracks. The washout was nice and flat, free of any human-made tracks. This freaked me out. It's not possible that you could pass through this area and not leave a mark somewhere. I made a search in winding loops from the center of the washed-out road, covering at least a hundred feet in every direction picking up the original tracks that led to the dead end and not finding them reappear anywhere. They were just gone. I put my hand in the last two tracks, both feet again side by side, like someone had taken their shoes off and stuck them in the perimeter of the mud to make two perfect prints. They were still soft, pliable, and the mud hadn't hardened yet still wet from the evening before. We pushed onto the Wiferno, all the while our eyes fixed on the ground, trying to find even the slightest hint of track. There was nothing. Whatever it was, its tracks appeared on our road, somewhere between 11.30ish, when we went to bed, and 4.30 in the morning, when my dad woke up. They walked past two grown men who were both light sleepers, passing mere inches by one of their faces, then proceeded to goose step down a hill, down into the arroyos, and run up and down the arroyo walls as it marched on down to the washed out road it had just been on, only to then disappear again, all in the middle of the night, in the middle of nowhere, on a random summer night. To this day, I think about those prints 
and really wonder what they could have been. The skeptic in me is just as puzzled as the believer side of me. I really have no idea how or why this small-footed, long-legged person or thing just casually walked past our tent down into some arroyos, which at night are dark and spooky as hell, and then disappeared back into the night it came from. I've discussed it with my dad, and he holds the opinion that it might be a good thing we didn't wake up and see whatever the hell was out there, because while we've never felt afraid down there, that day we did. In all the years before and since, we've never had an encounter like that, and while we have had other weird things happen to us down there, involving voices on the wind and other weirdness, nothing tops that for me, and at night, when I'm all alone, lying in bed thinking about this, I can't help but wish I had seen it, whatever it was. Because the mystery of it will confound and thrill me until my dying day.